Today, I'm going to talk to you about 12 ways to preserve food. Um, one thing uh, I want to tell you is that you always want to follow a recipe. I learned that the hard way, no matter how educated I have become and all the years as a chef, 45 years I've been a professional chef. And, um, but I still follow recipes and I write recipes too, you know. And so that's one of my biggest recommendations for people. And another recommendation is to grow your own food whenever possible. So I have, uh, you know, my gardens at home, a lot of the uh, preserves that I made are from the garden. And um, I didn't grow this kale, but very often I grow my own kale for that uh, product as well. So we're gonna say that uh, probably the number one way to preserve food is freezing. And most everybody freezes, you know, when you have excess things, right? Um, but one little tip, especially if you're gonna be freezing, uh, like say green beans, peas, things like that, you always wanna blanch them for like a minute and then shock them. So blanching is boiling in, you know, water and then uh, cooling them down immediately by shocking them in ice water. That will do a lot of things to the, uh, it actually helps to uh, preserve them in a you know, more vital way. Um, it can even work on uh, destroying some of the lectins. Lectin is a protein that's on the outside of uh, a lot of um, plants, you know, uh, products. And so um, that helps that. And a lot of people have problems digesting the lectins, so. You wanna just do that for a minute. Um, these extra steps will help to guarantee a long-term storage for you. Um, and the enzymes uh, will affect the quality of the product if you, if you can you know, break down some of those enzymes. Um, vacuum sealing is kind of new to a lot of people. Um, these you know, herbs, I dry the herbs in a couple of different ways. Um, dehydration with a dehydrator. This is a type of dehydrator that most people at home have. I do have um, what's called an Excalibur, which is a bigger, more expensive unit. But like, you know, you've got the various types of um, uh, trays and then you can buy little, um, you know, like mats to go on top for things that you don't want to fall down. Cause when something dehydrates, it goes, it, it goes down to about a third or even a fourth of the original size. So like I'll dehydrate my garlic, for example. A lot of times I'll, you know, grow uh, my own garlic. Most of the time I do. And then I dehydrate it. Then I put it in the food processor, turn it into a powder and get some really good salt. You know, if you're gonna use salt, Use like Redmond salt from Utah or Celtic sea salt or some type of, um, you know, salt from, you know, the Mediterranean, you know, use a good salt in other words, because it contains at least 80 minerals. Part of the problem with people today, they get sick because they don't get enough minerals. The soil has been stripped of uh, nutrients and uh, minerals as probably Jerry mentioned. And, um, you know, then you eat the food and you don't get the minerals that your body needs. And a lot of uh, illness is caused from lack of uh, the right minerals in the body. You can get that through, uh, get some of that replenished through the salt. Yes. Himalayan as well. Well, Himalayan is good, but it, that's, uh, that's excavated from the Himalayan salt mines, right? And some of the sea salt has sea minerals that um, are not in, you know, that... The, the be, one of the best ones is called Baja Gold. It's kind of expensive. Um, uh, and then I use um, Celtic sea salt is, is one that like a lot of people really recommend and from the Celtic sea, obviously, right? So that's just a couple tips on that. Um, the biggest uh, thing that I do every year is, um, it, can you bring up the water bath canner underneath that big, so most everybody knows about water bath canning. The thing with water bath canning is that it gets up to 212 degrees, which is boiling, okay? 
So you're gonna, you know, you have your handy dandy little, you know, lifter here that uh, you put your jars on obviously, and then you submerge it down under the boiling water, um, making sure that you always pay attention to sanitation and hygiene. That's one of the biggest things because um, bacteria, uh, botulism, that kind of thing can really uh, affect the quality of the food and you can get sick. So you have to really pay attention to, strict attention to sanitation and hygiene when you're water bath canning or any type of canning for that matter. And then there's the high pressure, you know, like a pressure canner. I didn't bring the pressure canner with me because I had limited space, but um, with the pressure canner, you typically will pressure can things that are low acid foods, low pH, right? The high acid foods go nicely into the water bath canner. And so that's pretty much, you know, like a strict rule. Anything that's high in acid tomatoes, you know, pickles, because they have, you know, either vinegar or lemon juice, um, you know, they have a higher acid, you know, content. And then you've got your little, you know, lifter that lifts your jars out of the water. And then when they come out of the water, the seal will go, you know, and you'll just be like so happy when you hear that <laughs> noise. Otherwise, if it doesn't seal, you want to make sure that you take the cover off, clean the cover, clean the rim. Before you actually can this, you're going to take uh, vinegar on... Um, that's what I use is vinegar around the rim. And that actually cleans. They used to say, you know, clean the inside of the rim too, but at least you have to make sure there's nothing on the uh, top of this rim. Uh, any of you here canners or have you done canning? So a lot of you have and a lot of you haven't. So I'm just giving you those recommendations for canning. This little funnel comes in handy to keep the inside rim clean while you're doing this. This one lifts up the, you know, the metal that's got a magnet on the end to lift out um, the, the lid. Um, and then uh, you always want to make sure that you, I, I like to use this one, but you poke this down all the way around and in the middle, or you can use a chopstick or anything like that. And it releases the air bubbles because if there's air inside your jar, you can get like botulism, spores, you know, things that, you know, you don't want because it'll cause it to spoil in many cases um, and maybe make you sick. Okay. So um, we touched um, lightly on that. Um, these, the high temperatures will kill the bacteria in most cases, 99% of the time. Um, dehydrating. Dehydrating basically sends warm air through, you know, the product and, and they, you know, it, there's like an open air. It's almost like a convection fan force air going through. So that helps to dehydrate it. Then you can also get one of these, which I love. I got this last year. I love this thing. And you see, I put my parsley in there and you just put layers in the, it's pretty good size, right? So I got mint in there. And then later, you know, this week, I'm going to be harvesting like the rosemary, the chives, the, you know, thyme, the cilantro. You know, I grow a couple of different types of thyme. You know, never enough thyme, right? I always say. So um, you have to make sure that you, this is nice because this can hang in your basement, providing that you don't have a really wet basement. And it will slowly dry it out to like a perfect consistency. Look at that, it's like, it's still colorful. I did not blanch or shock any of these herbs. I just dried them right from out of there. And this golden thyme is probably, as a culinarian, one of my absolute favorites. It has such a wonderful smell and taste and it just really enhances the um, flavor of anything that you cook with it. Golden lemon thyme or citrus thyme, they call it too. Yeah, but look, you can do cilantro. You know, cilantro. You cannot find, like, sometimes you just can't find good cilantro, right? Some of the stuff in the grocery store has no taste, no flavor. I don't want to say most, but 
let's say some, okay. I tend to shop mostly at like, you know, the, the Whole Foods, you know, not to give them a plug, but you know, I try to get all organic personally. And even with my growing, I grow strictly organic. So no, you know, poisonous chemicals or pesticides, right? Now, another form of preservation is pickling. So if you could bring a jar of pickles over here, please. Um, I did four or five different types of pickles this year, and I'm not finished. I want to do zucchini relish. I don't know if you've heard of zucchini relish. And I also want to do green tomato pickles. It's a great way to use up your uh, green tomatoes at the end of the summer, you know, but look at how gorgeous that is. It's beautiful. And that color is from turmeric. All right. Turmeric's such a good thing um, to use, but these are called bread and butter pickles. All right. I also make what's called, I, I call them icicle pickles. So you know how you find in your garden, you'll find a like a, a cucumber that's like, whoa, and it's gold, you know, it's lost all of its green color. And you go, oh, have to throw that out. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. You take and you cut the ends off, peel it, cut it in quarters, slip out the seeds, and then all you have is the flesh left. And you brine them overnight in ice water, ice water solution with salt. Okay, the salt draws the moisture out of the cucumber and it makes it crisp up by being in the refrigerator overnight in the ice water. And then you drain that off, rinse off the salt. You don't want salty, salty pickles, right? And then you do your little brine and you just pour it. Um, you put your pickle, you know, your, um, your cucumbers in there. And when you do this, you, um, you really pack them in there tight because once you cook them a little more in the hot water, they shrink up, you know? So, but those icicle pickles are good. They're sweet, hot, spicy, yummy pickle. Uh, but these ones here are dill pickle chunks. And um, like I say, everything here is organic. We really try very hard to do all organic. Yes? And of course, that's not in vinegar, you use another solution. Well, you can do either way. The traditional way is with vinegar. Mm -hmm. These were made with vinegar, okay. vinegar and water, sugar, whatever. Um, but I, I have tried using just lemon juice uh, in a lacto-fermented, lactobacillus fermented fermentation, which we're going to cover here in a second. Um, that's good. They're what I call refrigerator pickles. They'll stay in the fridge for a couple months or so, but these will last like all winter, you know, and so this is the way I was taught as a child. This is the way we always pickled, but I do, I do some refrigerator pickles, but I don't have any today on sale. All right. Sorry. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> disappoint you, but anyways, um, when you do the lactobacillus fermentation pickling, um, the salt is what, you know, creates that lactic, lactic acid with, um, the, with the cucumber. It creates a low pH environment when you ferment like that. And so over here, I've got a little example of a uh, fermentation. And this is sauerkraut, which I started, what, three weeks ago. And so this contraption is <laughs> this, allows the gases to escape. Like if I covered that and left it, you know, to uh, ferment, it would, the jar would blow up. So you have to have this, this is like a backflow preventer valve and, and it will allow the air to escape. There's little tiny pinholes in the top of this thing. And it has a float in there. So what it does, it creates an anaerobic environment. Aerobic is air, like, it, you know, anaerobic is without air. So when you, when you put this together, you do your sauerkraut, for example. I put bags of water on top to push down the, um, the product, you know, the cabbage and everything, so that, you know, it won't, it won't rot, basically. And then this allows for the air to escape. 
you know, you can get a different type of jar like this, okay? And you can buy this whole, you know, creation. <laughs> and it has a little glass um, float, you know, that pushes the food down. The food has to be kept below the water level because if it goes above the water level, it will mold, mildew, rot, you know, taste terrible, smell terrible. And so you can buy these little kits, oh, and that helps you a lot. Um, another way to preserve is with this. Um, this is a mason jar vacuum sealer. So this fits um, either a small lid, which is um, like that size, basically, right here, okay? Or um, the larger jar, so it will do either. And you would put your product on here, in there, I mean. The same way with this, this is a smaller version. And then you just put this on there and touch the button. It, ha it comes with a little um, jack to, um, you know, juice it up with electricity and keep it, you know, um, fortified or whatever. And then you just use whichever size you, you need. You know, this one is for the smaller one and this one is for the larger one. And so you, it only takes a couple seconds. If you want to preserve, say you make your own crackers or you want to uh, preserve nuts or anything that like goes rancid really quickly, you, you would use this and then you just, um, it comes with a handy dandy little, <laughs> if I can find it now, a little jar uh, opener, okay? So once it's, you know, you just, you know, open it up and then you can reseal it afterwards. These are like 20 or $25 and well worth their money in product that you would normally waste and throw away, you know? Um, with that said, this is another form, uh, food saver. So this is another form of, you know, preservation. So this comes with the little, um, you know, suction goes in there and then you've got your bags, comes with the bags. Um, it has a little hole indentation here that you stick this in, okay? And then you, it just sucks all the air out of the bag. Comes with all a couple of different size bags. And this one here, you actually cut. So you put this in there, you put your food in there, cut the end, you seal the end, and it just, you know, pulls all the air out, vacuum seals it. So vacuum sealing will create like several more months of um, quality product that you might normally, you know, be throwing out. Uh, jams and jellies, if you could show us a couple of uh, examples. So we have been canning, we meaning me, <laughs> I have been canning for the last couple of months to prepare for today's event. And I always do it every year. It's not just for the, the event, but um, I just love, love being able to go into my pantry um, and open up a fresh jar from, you know, some of the fruit is so perfect this time of year. It's like you go buy it in a grocery store and you go, oh, it's going to go bad. I would love to buy it, but I know it's going to go bad before I get to use it. Well, you know, even though it does have sugar, I do try to use organic cane sugar, um, unrefined. You can can with honey, but it does come out a little different than, you know, uh, flavor wise and textural wise. OK, so I've tried them both, tried all kinds, you know, of versions, you could do maple syrup, anything that's sweet, you can do. But, um, okay, but you know, this different kinds of, uh, you know, many different types as preserves, as conserves, as jellies, as jams. I like to be jamming, okay? <laughs> I like jamming. And, you know, put a little music on and dance around the kitchen, have fun doing this. But, you know, like this one here is stone fruit. So at uh, certain times of year, stone fruits are in season. In the winter, 
you get a piece of stone fruit and it's hard as a rock. So this is a nice way to, um, you know, to preserve the harvest of the summer. And uh, it's flavorful. Knows what stone fruit is. Am I the oh. only one yeah, that did not know? Never heard of it. Oh, okay. stone fruits. Um, Jerry could probably explain it better than me. <laughs> but it's when you have the little stone in the center. A cherry is a stone fruit. A peach is a stone fruit. A plum, a nectarine, those kinds of things, right? And even with peaches, there's cling peaches. And then there's, um, what's the other one, Jerry? Well, there's cling peaches and there's the other peach that I can't... With the cling peach, it clings to the stone fruit. The other one just opens up and you could just, you know, and I can't think of what the name of it is right now. But anyways, these also make wonderful gifts during the holidays that's upcoming. So that's what I do. I make them every year and I usually end up giving away <laughs> most of what I make. But it's such a delight to do it, you know. Now this one is a hot pepper jelly, which is so awesome with a little vegan cream cheese and on a cracker with, you know, a little of this, you know, zesty, um, yummy, spicy, sweet uh, jelly. So that's an example. We've got the stone fruit. We've got blueberry, strawberry. I grew the strawberries and I grew the blueberries. Um, there's um, this one here I'd like to show you, please. This one is called a uh, plum cot. So they've taken a plum and they've, um, you know, what do you call it? Spliced it with an apricot, <laughs> you know? Um, and I really love the flavor of this. And this has Jerry's blackberries. I call it, my husband and I call it Susie's bluesies and Jerry's berries. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, this is a plum cot and blackberry jam. Very unusual taste, very lovely taste. So it's a kind of a little bit of a gourmet thing, you might say. But um, like if you have, you know, holidays are coming up, you don't want to spend a lot of money or, you know, you can't spend a lot of money. Uh, but you want to take something special to your neighbor, your friend, your whatever. Uh, be a good neighbor and give them a jar of jelly or pickles or something and learn how to do your own. You know, we should have a class on making jelly and jam, I guess, right? We probably should. So anyways, we'd be jamming this time of year. And those can last up to a couple of years. I mean, I've, I've, I've made jams that I've used three, three, four years down the road because the high sugar content, and I do try to cut down on the sugar, just so you know. I If it says eight cups of sugar, I'm like, oh no, ain't gonna be no eight cups of sugar going in my jam. Yeah. So I would use half of that, maybe five cups. Um, and you know, you're not gonna get the same exact result. You know, it could be a little, le a little uh, it's not gonna be as firm. Let's put it that way. The thing that makes the uh, jam get firm, by the way, is the pectin. And one of the little secrets I learned was, say you're making cherry jam. Cherry is very low in, um, very low acid, right? It's not like some of the other stuff. And so I just grate up a couple of apples and the apple has a lot of pectin. So I start out with that. And so that's just a little tip. And so high in sugar, low in pH, but can last up to years doing it this way. We talked about vacuum sealing a little bit. This food saver system is very, very good. This will uh, sometimes, uh, you know, with vegetables, can last up to two or three years using this thing, sucking out all the air. The air is what causes oxidation and, and spoiling. So fresh fruit and berries, um, you can seal that way, soups, breads, you know, breads up to three years can be kept, you know, depends on the type of, you know, bread that you're making. Uh, then there's cold storage. So, you know, back in the day, they used to dig a hole in the ground and, you know, in the ground went the, you know, beets and the carrots and the root vegetables, the potatoes and all that stuff. And so cold storage, uh, they also call it cold cellaring. You know, if you have a cold cellar, you know, you can keep it stored in your cellar um, for many, many months. It should be 40 degrees 
around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And um, with a high humidity. And like I said, you can dig a hole in the ground <laughs> and, and you can keep things like pumpkins and squash for several months, if not all winter. Yeah. Um, and then drying, we talked about air drying, hanging them, you know, for use later in the year. All the herbs prefer hang drying. In this, this creates heat. So the heat actually will make sometimes like the chives and things like lose their color. But hanging them, just hanging them in bunches, you know. My great great uncle, because I'm from the Passamaquoddy, oops, sorry, <laughs> Passamaquoddy um, Indian tribe uh, up in Maine, and he was a medicine man. And my grandmother used to tell me about him. And uh, she said, you could go into his house. Now, back then, they had all open rafters. You know, it wasn't like these modern houses nowadays, right? But big open rafters, like in here. And all the herbs hanging from the ceiling. He could tell you what to make, how to use it to heal just about anything, to make a poultice or a compress or any of those types of things. And, you know, we've had, I've had classes myself, I've given classes on what I call kitchen remedies or garden remedies. And there's so many things that we can do with stuff right from the garden. Cabbage, garlic, you know, cayenne pepper, for example, in um, Back to Eden, Jethro Kloss's book, um, he he he's, he's, he has about a half a page maybe on almost every herb, but cayenne pepper, 10 pages. It is an amazing miracle herb, it really is. So anyways, getting off subject here, sorry. <laughs> um, infusion is another type of food preservation. I didn't bring, I forgot to bring my example of an infused oil. But um, you can infuse, um, you know, cherries, uh, you can infuse herbs. Mostly I do herbs, right? But you could do garlic, garlic oil. You go to the store, it's $12.99 for a little teeny skinny bottle of it. And you can just get your own good quality organic first cold pressed olive oil and make your own infused oils. So that's another tip. Um, once they're extracted, um, you can leave you can leave the herb in there and then just keep putting more, or you can take the herbs out and then replace it with new fresh herbs and um, just keep refilling the bottle. Um, and they can be used for marinades or dressings and things like that. Um, immersion is something that most people don't do. Most immersion is done with um, alcohol, you know, so, you know, I don't usually do much in the way of using alcohol, although I do make my own vanilla. And, um, you know, it takes about two years to do the vanilla. So I buy the best vanilla beans, grade A, that you can find from Tahiti and Madagascar and all over the world. And you can order them and you can make enough vanilla and I often, I did, I ran out of time. <laughs> I would have done some for today to sell. Um, but um, it takes about two years for them to really be extracted. And the minimal amount of alcohol, like say you used a vodka in it, for example, um, is cooked off. You know, you use a teaspoon of vanilla, right? But it's cooked off in the cooking process. So it's not like you're, you know, drinking it or whatever. Although back in the day, I guess they used to do that too. And um, you can also use vegetable glycerin, which I've used before uh, to make uh, vanilla. So I've used that and um, I make several different types, but the best vanilla beans you can find and it will, I mean, you, you just will never have to buy vanilla again. <laughs> and you've seen the price of vanilla, like $20 for a little bottle. So for twenty dollars, you can buy a, a you know five or six vanilla beans from wherever you buy them from, and um, you can make your own. So immersion was an another one, um, and then salting, which most people don't do anymore. But I remember as a kid, they used to, they used to, you know. Well, I grew up in Maine, and you know everyone went deer hunting. You know, venison is the cleanest meat. You know, I'm not a meat eater myself, but uh, 
you know, if you were and you were a hunter, you know, venison is the cleanest meat that it, that there is. Any master chef can tell you that. Um, they are vegetarian, so they eat only berries and leaves and whatever. You know, they, they don't eat carcass of other animals and stuff. So anyways, they're clean meat is what I'm trying to say. And they would salt the meat to keep it for the winter. You know, we have it so easy nowadays. Yes, you know, we got refrigerators. You look at these, you know, people in some of these third world countries, they don't even have refrigerators. You know, these, uh, I, I, I work with an orphanage in Uganda and uh, they don't have electricity. <laughs> you know, they don't have, you know, we just flip a switch and take it for granted. But, you know, praise God, thank you, Jesus. I have to say, thank you, Lord for uh, we're in a country like we live in and we should not take one day for granted. I had to say that. Okay, so salt brining, that will kill the bacteria. Okay, salt is uh, pres preservative, it will kill the bacteria. Um, but you have to either soak it or rinse it afterwards, you know, because salt absorbs, right? And then there's freeze drying. Freeze drying, uh, provides the ability to remove all the moisture from the food product. And the food will last 25 years if you have a freeze dryer, but they're a thousand dollars, you know, and there's no way I can uh, afford that, but you can freeze dry anything. You can make your own potato chips from zucchini and squash and different things. And, uh, and it's just a wonderful thing. So uh, if you can afford it, get yourself a freeze dryer. Now, I want to make sure that I make a little plug about part of the reason that we want to preserve food is we believe that we're living in the last days of Earth's history. And we believe that uh, Jesus is coming again soon. And we believe that uh, we should be prepared for emergencies. We saw in the last four years what happened when everything was shut down and food couldn't get through so, you know, I'm a big uh, advocate of growing your own food, first of all. And Jerry and I, we both teach garden classes to try to inspire people and teach people and help them to learn how to grow their own food. You know, you do have to have some land, you know. I did one little class on grow your dream garden on a quarter acre or less. And that's what I have, a quarter of an acre. And I grow a lot of food. I can barely keep up with the harvest <laughs> when it's time to harvest. And you gotta, when it's ready, you gotta jump on it. You can't be waiting around, you know, cause it don't wait for you. So you have to make sure that you're, you know, able to do it. And, um, you know, because we know that there's a time of trouble that's gonna come upon this earth that has been nothing like it ever in the world and never will be. And the more that we can do to pre protect ourselves and our family and, and prepare for that, the better off we are. And at our church, we're going to be having um, a class on, uh, on grid shutdown preparedness. All right. So a couple years ago, we did a wilderness survival classes. And um, upcoming, we're going to be focusing a lot on that. And being ready, you know, and I'm talking about on every level, spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, financial, get out of debt. If you're in debt, get out of debt. All right. I didn't want this to be a sermon or anything. <laughs> okay. But I just want to make sure that I mention that. So anyways, the important to preserve foods when they're at their peak. Okay. And Remember the sanitation and hygiene. Everything has to be immaculately clean. You can keep the jars in the oven when you're doing this preparation. I use the dishwasher because it's, you know, it's so convenient, right? Um, and you have to time it just right so everything comes out nice and hot when it's ready. You go do your thing. You got all your stuff ready. We call that mise en place, having everything in its place. And... Um, and so you can also do the jars right in the oven at like 200 degrees. So once they're hot, clean, you know, slip them in the oven when you're ready. You just pull them out and fill them and the rest is history, you know. Um, and 
follow a recipe, follow the safety <laughs> guidelines. If you don't know, look it up. You can find any information that you want online nowadays, right? Now, these lids and bands, you know, I don't usually reuse them myself. They actually come when you buy them in the store. They come with like a little special kind of uh, glaze over them, if you will. When, you, when, when you're ready to use these, they just have to be put in like hot water. They do not have to be boiled because that actually will actually cause a, a problem for you in the long run. So you just want them really hot, you know, clean, of course, hot soapy water, rinse, whatever. Put them, I just put them, you know, in a little hot water. And then when I'm ready, I just use that little handy dandy little magnet, pick them up and put them on the thing. And so you have all your tables set out ready uh, to, to finish that. You can reuse the bands, but you have to be very careful about doing it. If you do reuse them, I mean the lids, um, just check them really thoroughly. If you use something to open this, if there's even a little indentation here, what it does, it can allow air to get in and bacteria. So just be really careful about doing it because you don't want botulism. And that would that does um, guarantee a proper suction. And so um, that's very important. And another thing that I use a lot is the scale. Uh, weigh everything, you know, make sure that you weigh things, go by the recipe, like I said. And with salt, you have to make sure that you use the proper type of salt, canning salt, pickling salt, you know, don't just use any salt. And as a matter of fact, if at your house, if you have that salt that comes in a little blue container, the little round with the girl with the umbrella, go home and throw it out because it is iodized salt. They made that way back when, when um, people were very low in iodine, right? You can get now iodine drops from, uh, the. it's derived from like kelp, from sea minerals, okay? And I just put a drop in my water and that's perfectly good. But that iodized salt, what that does, uh, you know, the doctors all tell you, don't, uh, don't, don't use salt because, you know, if you have blood, blood pressure, don't use salt, right? But that is referring to that type of salt that it has only two elements in it, sodium chloride and, sodium and, and chlorine. And what they do to make that salt, they take the salt from the sea, they dry it, okay? And then it's gray. So when you get good salt from the sea, it, it is gray and it's moist because salt absorbs water. If it's raining out, my salt cellar will be, you know, kind of hardened up a little bit. Well, with that type of salt, it constricts the blood vessels, okay? It's what it does to the blood vessels, right? But with mineral salt, mineral, the minerals that's in there, especially the magnesium, in order for the water to get to the nucleus of the cells, and you have over 100 trillion cells in your body, in order for that to penetrate the cell, to get the water into the cell, you need magnesium. And there's several types of magnesium. We won't get into all that right now. But all I'm saying is make sure you use good quality salt. It will be saltier than salt. You know what I'm saying? So you don't need to use as much, all right? And Barbara O'Neill, who's one of my teachers, I've been following her for a dozen years before she became popular on, on the internet and everything. What she says, and I totally agree with her, at least, at least six to eight glasses of, you know, good water, not the stuff out of the tap, because the tap water has fluoride and chlorine in it. It has to be like, you know, I don't want to say spring water, but at least filtered water, okay? What she does, you, she keeps a salt cellar, like just a little jar, you know, salt. She keeps one next to her bed. She keeps one in the bathroom. She keeps one in the kitchen. She keeps one on the dining room table. When she has her water, let's say six to eight glasses a day, every time she goes to have a glass of water, she takes the salt under your tongue, it sublingually, 
goes into your bloodstream and those minerals get taken to your into your bloodstream. It passes the blood brain barrier. It does not have to be digested. It goes into your circulatory system and these minerals that you've put under your tongue after it's absorbed into, then you drink your water, you know, your glass of water. And she says, sip during the day. Don't go, 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 go. I see my husband do that. I'm like, don't do that. That's like taking the water and going whoosh, on your plants outside. No, your plants will drown too. So your system is not made to go like, whoa, what are you doing to me? You know, you have to slowly get, you know, I'm not saying like take all day to drink a glass of water, be reasonable. I'm saying, you know, drink two, three ounces, four ounces, whatever, set it down in a few minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, drink the rest of the glass and do that six or eight times a day. Your body will benefit unbelievable. Your skin hydrated. Oh, how many people are going out buying all this stuff to goop up their skin and whatever. I don't use anything on my skin. I'm over 70. Okay. My skin is moist. Uh, you know, and, and if you're going to use something on your skin, use coconut oil, you know, organic first cold pressed coconut oil, olive oil. Don't use this other junk. Don't use this stuff. If you can't pronounce it, or you can't spell it, or your grandmother didn't use it, you don't need it, all right? So um, basically, I want to just say that as best as you can, you want to preserve the food, preserve your body. You know, the longer that you live, the more the time you have to follow after the master, the more uh, days that you have to live a full, rich life, you know, God wants us to do that. And it's necessary for us to do that. Do you have any questions by any chance? Yes? So the mineral salt, can we use that magnesium or Epsom salt? Not in your mouth. No, that's for outside. So you can soak your feet in it. At night, I do that sometimes. Um, and always wash your feet at night. No, I, I mean, that probably sounds weird to say that, but <laughs> I go barefoot all the time. Now, I'm a country girl, and you can take the girl out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the girl, all right? So at church, I'm always saying, take them shoes off. Let's go out and do some earthing, you know, some grounding. The best time to ground is first thing in the morning while the dew is still on the roses, all right? And um, you go out there and it only takes six minutes of your day. What happens, and especially after a thunder and lightning storm at night, the electromagnetic energy that hits the earth, you know, bang, bang, you know, you are absorbing that. The biggest pores on your body are in the bottom of your feet. So when you go out there in the morning, oh, the grass feels so good in your feet. And, and it can be sand. It can be, you know, dirt, earth, your garden, whatever. But it doesn't work on wood, okay? Um, it, it, it does actually work with a, like a porous thing like um, brick, you know, or uh, terracotta, those kinds of things. But typically you want to go out, you want to absorb the energy. Go hug a tree. You know, that, that sounds crazy. Oh, are you a tree hugger? Yeah, I'm a tree hugger. I'll be the first to admit it, you know. And the energy you're getting from that tree, it, it, what it does in your body is the electrons and the protons that's in your body, it, it electrifies you. So your body, your, oh, excuse me, I am electric. Okay, so your heart is an electric machine, okay? And, you know, you hear about electrolytes and th things like that, right? Well, that's because your body is electric. And when you are doing that, you're absorbing those things from the earth. It will help you in, I'm going to do a class on just that kind of stuff. I think people need, need to know about that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, and don't forget, plant a seed. All right, take a tiny seed and plant it. Yes. So you said it's the pectin or 
or chertel that makes the jelly pink. That's yeah. Jelly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the sugar help also? Or yes, it does. Okay. Yes. So my question was, can I use stevia in place of sugar? I have tried it, and it really does not taste good. Uh, I mean, I, I even grow stevia. If you grow the stevia, you can make iced tea and stuff with it, but I don't. I don't recommend using it for can for jellies. No. Anything else? Yes. Where do you usually buy salt? Uh, I order mine on Amazon, but you can get it from Whole Foods. Uh, a lot of stores now carry it, and the French gray salt. When you get it, it's it's gray and it's moist. You open it, it's like you can smell the ocean. Yeah, it's Ocean's so good. State. Ocean, State has Ocean State might have it, yeah. How about distilling the water? Yeah, distilled water. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. When you're doing uh, pickles and sauerkraut and stuff like that, use distilled water. And to drink, I drink it. Yeah, you can, you know, but you got to be careful. Not everybody can drink it, like, uh, as your exclusive water. Mineral water. I go for mineral water myself. But when you distill water, it takes all the minerals out. Right, certain minerals you can't absorb anyway. So. Yeah, exactly. But still, you know, you got to watch, especially if you have health conditions. So I guess we're ready to close this down. Um, uh, I hope and pray that all of you will do some canning. Get yourself a ball blue book if you if you don't have a canning book. Uh, this one has pretty much the best, you know, advice. So God bless you all. And see you soon, I hope. Thank you. Many blessings.